Cheryl swoops, you beautiful, actually not so beautiful, hunk of big ass, big mouth, stupid. We love you, Cheryl swoops. You're the gift that keeps on giving. First, you tell us that, well, Caitlin Clark used an extra year. She did. Shoots 40 times a game. She did. Cheryl Swoops is among the dumbest people ever and one of the most talented ever. Really, if you look at Cheryl Swoops' basketball history, she certainly should be considered among the greats. But all that goes away when you're inherently stupid. If you look at Cheryl Swoops' coaching career, abuse, abusing players. Who knows what Miss Crazy did at Loyola of Chicago when she got banished to the backwoods of podcasts, to the backwoods of blogs. That's right. That's where one of the goats of all time in women's basketball has been banished. Do you see Cheryl Swoops broadcasting games? Maybe you do, but if you do, I haven't seen her. Why? Well, because she's a special kind of ugly, and I'm not talking externally. I'm talking internally. She's a special kind of disgusting. So when she went at the little white girl, and let's be honest, we all know that she went at Caitlin Clark because she's a little white girl, little white heterosexual girl, and I think Swoops may be heterosexual too, but who knows. And that just pisses the old guard off. A little white girl coming in to college basketball, breaking records, going to be the number one pick, and getting all of this publicity. It has to be racism. Swoops would cry. There has to be special treatment, so Swoops would lie. And next thing you know, Swoops got called out on it because, Cheryl Swoops, this isn't 2020. This isn't where people are afraid to stand up against some of the stupidity of both black and white people. Remember our friend Grant Napier who had a tweet that said all lives matter and got fired because two of the biggest dummies in the history of sports, Chris Reber and Boogie Cousins, got mad. And the Kings went and hired the worst human being in broadcasting, and that's saying a lot, Mark Jones, in a really good dude, Grant Napier's place. Well, this ain't that time. We now, all of us, black and white, are free to speak. We stand up. And good for Cheryl Swoops. She stood up. But Cheryl Swoops, when called out, went Cheryl Swoops, which is akin to going stupid. So here's what Cheryl Swoops had to say, defending her lies about Caitlin Clark. So for people to come at me and say that I made those comments because I'm a racist, like, first of all, black people can't be racist, but, like, that's the farthest thing from my mind. Like, I grew up in a very small West Texas town, predominantly white. My best childhood friend is white. Winter, predominantly white. College, won a national championship. Pretty much everyone on the team was white. Like, we're sisters to this day. Like, like that's not a part of my DNA. Um, I have, like, no issues with Caitlyn. Her breaking the record, I think, obviously, is a tremendous accomplishment. Um, but I, I think what Caitlyn has done for not just college basketball, but for women's basketball, period, I think has been great. The following, people watching the game, sellouts that we haven't seen ever. I have a black friend. His name is Reggie Jones. We go to lunch. I can't be racist. Well, black people (laughs) are absolutely capable of being racist. You know, hey, white boy. I mean, how many times do you hear that? There is no more racism than Jalen Rose with his white boy wasted. I mean, I'm reading the code words every day. Are you kidding me? And it doesn't bother me. I just look at racist people, both black and white, as inherently stupid. And good for Cheryl Swoops for coming out and saying, hey, look, I got a white friend. I went to a white college. Well, you went to a white college because they offered you a scholarship down there in Texas. Anyway, the idea that black people can't be racist is inherently stupid. We hear it every day. Every single day we hear racism from white people. All you got to do is turn on ESPN and watch the shows. And all you got to do is know any of the code words, and they're always there. Cheryl Swoops, 
Let's give her the benefit of the doubt. Let's say that Cheryl swoops when she lied about Caitlin Clark wasn't doing it because of race. So then we have to say Cheryl swoops is just evil, jealous, and of course, stupid. I mean, listening to Cheryl Swoop speak, she's just stupid. Looking at, at, at what she said about Caitlin Clark, she's just stupid. Something inside the stupid makes the stupid say stupid things a lot. Whenever they're asked about something they're uncomfortable with. Everybody that is stupid, myself included, can hide our stupidity when we talk about something we're comfortable with. But a white girl in basketball breaking a record? Oh, my God, a.k.a. O-M-G. I'm uncomfortable with that. And the stupid immediately go to stupid comments. She had an extra year. She didn't. She shoots 40 times a game. She didn't. She's like 24 years old. She isn't. It's what the stupid do. I have studied the stupid because I'll tell you why. I think the most dangerous person, And I said this about a couple, one kid in particular that I coached at Indiana. The combination of arrogant and stupid is the most dangerous combination, and Cheryl Swoops has it. She's got it in her DNA, and maybe she should because she was a great basketball player. And that's pretty much it. But anyway, think about it. Arrogant and stupid. I'm stupid but I'm too arrogant to realize I'm stupid. Thus, I say things like black people can't be racist. If you're arrogant and smart, smart people generally can self-evaluate. All right, wait a second here. Yeah, that was wrong. You see the difference? Arrogant and stupid makes you double down on your stupidity. Arrogant and smart makes you go, huh? Yeah, that was wrong. Yeah, you know what? What I said was wrong. But the idea that black people can't be racist is the most laughable thing that there is. You know, back in the day when people were writing and we were all feel, supposed to feel sorry for those that were writing until we realized that this is just criminal behavior, dangerous criminal thuggery, white folk had to stay quiet. Couldn't say a word. Hey, I didn't. I'd be on my radio show and I would stay quiet on all of it because I knew the lay of the land. And the lay of the land was what Cheryl Swoop said. Black people can't be racist. <laughs> ask, it, ask your black friend if black people can be racist. And they'll laugh their ass off assuming your black friend isn't arrogant and stupid. My black friend, because I want to be like Cheryl Swoops and tell everybody I am a black friend. I actually have many black friends, but I think it's very funny that Cheryl Swoops goes with the I have a white friend. Because black guys make fun of white guys on the regular. See what I did there, yo? I spoke a little bit. On the reg. About what? You're not racist because you got a black friend? So Cheryl Swoops flipped it. Anyway, my black friend will tell you that, oh, man, the brothers are racist. The sisters are crazy racist. And Reggie's white friend, me, although he has a bunch, will tell you, yeah, you ain't lying there. And white dudes are racist as hell, too. It's just the world we live in. What can I tell you? But I like Cheryl Swoops. Cheryl Swoops gives good content. Cheryl Swoops is awful. She's stupid. She's arrogant. And keep keep it coming, S. Swoops, because you're a content, idiotic, arrogant, stupid machine. Bingo. Speaking, speaking, ladies and gentlemen, of content machines, Stephen A. Smith and others will eventually do this. But I've said this for years in the world of coaching. In the world of coaching, do you want equal treatment or do you want equal but special treatment? Now, what does that mean, Dan? You know, there have been great coaches. When Bruce Weber comes to mind, the head coach at Illinois who took him to the national championship game, did great things there in southern Illinois, all that stuff. The That take a while to interview. Like, I could go into an interview for any job, any time, walk out, and go, and they would go, hey, huh, probably should hire that guy. I can't. I can interview well. 
Like, I can take all of those uh, evaluation tests and make myself out to be like a Mensa. Not actual questions about stuff. Like, I can't answer one solar system question. Not one. Now, I was at trivia night with my wife, and I, I can't answer. I don't know the order of the plan. I don't know nothing. I don't know nothing about a lot. But you know those mental tests? I've got a thing inside my brain that flips, and I know the answers that they want. So I can get a great score on those Briggs Myers and all of those tests because I'm smart enough to do that. Well, I said the same thing. Bruce Weber, tough interview, could not interview, could not get a job out of Purdue. Finally, Southern Illinois hires him, and he's a great coach. White dudes, black dudes, Asian dudes, Hispanic dudes, everybody is different. And sometimes when you interview, you're just not good at it. Or sometimes when you interview, the person you're interviewing with and you are incompatible. And it could be a lot of times. Well, that was never the case with the African-American coach. The African-American coach was a must-hire. We've got to hire this guy. Why? Well, because he's got a good resume and he's African-American. And then when they go interview him, he ain't any good. Case in point, Aaron, Eric Bieniemy. Eric Bieniemy has interviewed a bunch of times for a bunch of jobs, and nobody wants to hire him. Is that every owner's fault? Is that every GM's fault that has interviewed him? I do not think so. It wouldn't even be a question in the white dude world, but of course in the African-American world, and in the sports world where white guys are trying to appease African Americans, of course it's a big issue. Racist, they cried, as Eric Bieniemy couldn't get a job, but nine other African Americans did. Never made sense to me. Apparently it doesn't make sense to our guy, Stephen A. Smith. Smith says, well, I have spent years lamenting the state of affairs when it comes to the state of affairs. Oh, wow, he's trying to be smart with state of affairs. As it pertains to the National Football League and black coaches, I've spent years coming to the defense of Eric Bieniemy. Not anymore. Can't do it anymore. When I think about Eric Bieniemy, I think about how D'Amico Rines got the job in Houston. Mike McDaniels, who's biracial in Miami. Think about Mike Tomlin, who's been in Pittsburgh for 17 years. Think about Todd Bowles. Guys like that, really. Well, I like the fact that Stephen A. Smith is actually thinking and not talking. At one point, his mouth shut, his brain worked, and I'm thinking it's a pretty smart brain. I am. I think Stephen A. Smith's a pretty smart dude whose mouth overruns his intellect most times. But who am I to judge? My mouth overruns everything. It just does. But when you look at the, quote, plight of the African-American coach, all you got to do is basically present yourself in such a way that you're likable to the interviewer, you have a great resume, and you have a plan for that particular organization. That's what interviews are. You can have a plan for the particular organization. You can have a good resume. But if you are unlikable, at least to the people sitting across the table from you, you're probably not going to get the job regardless of you are if you are an African-American and Mike Freeman's going to write an article in USA Today if you don't get the job. But here's the deal behind. I always try to give you the deal behind the story. There's a big part of me that says, interesting, now that Eric Bieniemy is no longer in the NFL as he took a job as co-head coach, offense coordinator at UCLA, he's fair game. You got to understand something. When somebody is in the NFL that's an NFL guy, NFL media, including national media like Smith, a little bit less hesitant to criticize. Guy comes from out of the NFL like Urban Meyer, boy, it's on. It's like the NFL, NFL media are so provincial, so incestuous that we will criticize you certainly because, well, it's the NFL, it's big money, it's big business, that kind of thing. So we will criticize you. But we're not going to go to the extent where a guy like Stephen A. Smith says he's done with Eric Bieniemy. If Eric Bieniemy was still in the NFL, you would not hear Smith say that. That's the backstory. I watched how when Urban Meyer came in, with an impeccable 
resume. I mean to tell you, no major NCAA scandals, nothing. Some health issues. Okay, so what? Winning everywhere he's been, building everywhere he's been, dynamic offenses everywhere he's been. When he came into the NFL, the little NFL guys in the media, oh, man. It's almost like they get defensive on somebody coming into the NFL from outside. It's kind of fascinating, really. I've really watched this. So why is Smith all of a sudden talking about Eric Bieniemy and not talking about him being the next great thing? Well, first, what Smith said is absolutely true. There's no denying that. But second, now that he's out of the NFL, and for NFL guys, a school like UCLA, which to me is a big-time school, but to NFL people, it's minor league football. Now it's open season. So there's a little bit of cowardice from Smith, which we've come to expect over the years. But you know what? Good for him. I've said this forever. Be careful what you wish for. If you're going to make this big push to hire African-American this, African-American that, understand, African-American this and African-American that is going to be judged just like the white guy. If you don't win, yes is gone. If you win, You're all good with me, baby. Mike Tomlin hasn't been 17 years in Pittsburgh because Mike Tomlin is African-American or the Roonies are this philanthropic family. Mike Tomlin has lasted 17 years because he's won, and he's won big, period. Ain't no difference once you get the job. There's difference to get the job. There's, oh, my God, I got to hire an African-American. Oh, my God, we have to be diverse. Oh, my God. We've had three white coaches in a row. We must hire. There's all that to hire. But once you get hired, woo, doggy, you better win. Because nobody, and I mean nobody, in the world said it better than Al Davis. Just win, baby. You know, let me take a drink here because I don't do ads often, but I should for this. I drink like eight a day. Oh, man, our friend Greg Doyle, our friend Greg Doyle, no surprise, is a crazy flaming liberal and crazy being first. Now, full disclosure, Greg Doyle was a kind of friend of mine. I was going to have, when Greg Doyle moved to Indy, I was going to have Greg Doyle stay at my house. I told him, hey, you stay at my house. Until I realized what he was doing with young married women. And I had a young daughter in the house, and I'm going through a divorce. And I'm like, yeah, you can't stay, man. I got a 18 year I don't know how old my daughter was, 17, 18 years old, going through a hard time. There's no chance I was letting Greg Doyle stay at my house. I had Greg Doyle over to my house. We had a three-on-three tournament. Bunch of my buddies, three-on-three in a driveway. Dude could barely stand up, dribble a basketball, and shoot a basketball. And my buddy's like, this is the guy? This is the guy that writes about sports? This is the guy that tells us about sports? I'm like, yeah, man. That is your guy. Now he's a boxer of some, uh, I guess, some note. But he's a coward. I've always said, and he has admitted, this isn't speaking out of turn, when he did a hit piece on me, he admitted to one of his affairs. He acted like I knew about that affair of a woman in Cincinnati. I had no idea. I knew about two others, but I had no idea about it. Some woman in Charlotte, excuse me. I knew about one in Cincinnati. I knew about another one, ESPN reporter. But I didn't know about the one in Charlotte. So anyway, he's lied about that. He's always been a twister and a liar. But he's an entertaining read. He's a very entertaining read. Like, he's a very good writer when it doesn't pertain to sports. He's a very good writer when it comes to some guy that's an usher at the Pacer game. He's a very good writer when it comes to something behind. But in sports, he has flopped left and right and been actually, if you go around Indy in our city, he's a complete joke when it comes to sports. He called Archie Miller not a home run hire, but a grand slam hire. He told us all of the greatness that, uh, what's that guy, Ryan, the quarterback? I forget his first name. Whatever the hell his first name is. Matt Ryan, when he came to Indianapolis, the leadership. He told us how great Carson Wentz was until Carson Wentz didn't get vaccinated, and then he said he's going to take him out. Long story short, I've already given this idiot more time than he deserves. But he now is on the side of mutilating children. 
See, in Indiana, Indiana said, hey, look, we ain't mutilating children. We ain't doing it. We're not doing it. The federal court lets Indiana ban on gender-affirming care for minors take effect. History won't be kind on this decision. History won't be kind on a lot of things. Literally doesn't know a damn thing he's talking about. Literally trying to get me and you and others to talk about him. And congratulations, he did. But the gender-affirming care is also gender mutilation. And I got to tell you, there is a great article today at Outkick.com going at Doyle. Now, understand this. Kids can't smoke. Kids can't drink. Kids can't drive a car till a certain age. But somehow, some way, Greg Doyle and the rest of these left liberal crazy people want kids to be able to cut off their junk, want kids to be able to mutilate their bodies. Now, the woods is full, and I mean full, of kids that are looking back at this, parents that are looking back at this and saying, oh, man, this is the worst thing we've ever done. This is horrible. This is ridiculous. I don't know, and Doyle has had kids, but I don't know why anybody, anybody would think that a 6, 5, 8, 9, 10-year-old should be allowed and their parents should be enabled to chop up or chop off their private parts. I don't know why that's even a thing. It's almost like people are so stupid that they defy logic. And that's Doyle, although Doyle is very smart. Doyle is very, very, very smart. He's a smart man. I will give him that. But he's morphed into a guy that just simply wants clicks. He's more, my friend Ken Sterling said it best, he's just not real anymore. What you read about him just isn't real. You know what I mean? And you can't really call yourself an ally of transgender kids by, well, saying it's okay for a six-year-old to mutilate themselves. You can call yourself anything you want. I mean, and Doyle does. But there's no ally to six, eight, nine, seven-year-olds chopping off body parts. Because, frankly, six, eight, seven, nine-year-olds are still eating boogers. They don't know what they want to be. They don't want to be a fireman. No, I want to be a Barbie doll. No, I want to be, uh, I don't know, I want to be a police. No. But yet we let them make their decision and we support it in the media to chop off private parts because what? They're playing with a dress because what? We know some psychologists said, well, they really feel like they're a woman. Good. You know what will happen? When you get to be 16, that feeling will still be there and you can make an informed decision. But that's not Greg Doyle. That's not our liberal friends. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. He is, quote, a prototype, this is my friend, Alejandro Avia, a prototype of the current generation of woke online activists who will be remembered in American history as lazy and arrogant. Boy, is that true. I've never met a more insecure, arrogant human being in my life than Greg Doyle. And I've already given him way too much time. Doyle believes it's sacrosanct to provide gender-affirming care for kids, thus enabling the severing of their genitals, to rejigger their biological makeup at six years old. That's what Doyle does. Write more hit pieces on me, Doyle. Please write more hit pieces on me. It affirms my long-held belief that when god-awful people don't like you, you're doing the right thing. Man, can you imagine? Hey, Daddy, I just ate six boogers, but I want to cut my dick off. Oh, okay. (laughs) Oh, man. You can't make this shit up. You literally can't make this shit up. Hey, Daddy. Hey, Daddy. I just ate the head off my Barbie doll. Can we go to the doctor so I can get my vagina turned into a penis? Fucking evil people, man. Evil people. Hey, our friend Bomani Jones, he a uh, failure at everything that he has done. Full disclosure. True story. 
I went back and forth with Bamani Jones a few times on Twitter, and then one time he couldn't believe I was actually from Gary, Indiana, and I had to enlighten him on a on – a t- actually, this is kind of interesting. I was in Vegas uh, with Lee doing an uh, NBA summer league game, and Bamani Jones came at, at me on Twitter about being from Gary, Indiana. Man, Doc, he's from Gary, Indiana, something about the Jackson 5. And I had to enlighten him that my mother – in a stroller, at least this is what I believe. Maybe she'll text me and say it's wrong. This is a story I heard. You used to go to Gleason Park with me and my brother, and Mrs. Jackson, Kathy Jackson, would be there with their little girls, whoever they were. This is true. The Jackson Five used to practice at my grandfather's bar, the Caribou Lounge, because he had a stage, lights, and a dance floor. And on, like, Sunday mornings, the Jackson Five would practice there. And Jermaine Jackson, or one of the older ones, a confirmed with my brother a year ago at the opening of the Hard Rock in Gary that Joe Jackson and my grandfather used to go at each other really, really hard over the money that the Jackson Five were supposed to play, pay to play at my grandfather's bar. All right. Jones came at me about being from Gary, and I enlightened him on all those things. I just happened to be walking between with my wife from the Park Hotel, the MGM Park, to the Cosmopolitan, we were going to go get a drink, see what was going on, and who comes walking by us? Michael Smith and Bomani Jones. He looks at me and goes, hey, Dan, I really like you. I go, hey, Bomani, I really like you, and we kept on our way. So I like Bomani Jones. I do. But Bomani Jones' opinions used to be pretty good. I'm not kidding you. I used to like his thing the right time. I did. I thought it was great. And I kind of thought he was going to be a star. I did. But then he started getting too crazy. And then everything had to be about race. And I understand it because, well, at the time when Jones was coming up, race sold. I mean, the brothers saw Kaepernick getting paid, yo. And they, me, most of us are like, hey, I did. How can we get in on that? Right? I mean, everybody wanted to get paid by Nike. How can I get? If they're paying this guy to kneel, what can I do? But anyway, then Jones got whacked out. He was giving shows. He got too racial. People get tired of it. And away you go. But Monty Jones has has jumped in on court stormy, which, by the way, our man Kyle Filipowski from Duke, who we all thought had to have his leg amputated. If you looked at Jersey John Shire and the rest of the little Dukies, turned out he played and played pretty good last night. The court storm is like the encore on steroids. No one has any leverage over the kids once they get out there. True. It's in full on sight of lawlessness. Well, come on. And you know it's a state of lawlessness because if you looked at those clips of that game and you just saw the security like, y'all right, y'all coming down, you're not going to tell me that security at these games thinks this is a good idea. That's true. In fact, what we're talking about here is an anathema, okay, to their whole existence, right? Right. Like, this is what they exist to prevent, and they're like, all right, y'all got it. Y'all come on down. They know this is a horrific idea. Yeah. Yeah. You're not wrong. Look, if I was security, we've all seen clips of security guys trying to hold somebody back while 50 of them run past it. Like, grab this guy, and everybody runs past We've all seen that. Hey, I'm not mad at Bomani Jones for this stand. I don't know that it's lawlessness. I mean, I don't see crimes being committed. I don't see AKs. I don't see Glocks, and I don't see machetes being wielded. It's a bunch of college kids with phones trying to be cooler than the next and get the shot that makes them go viral and makes them a YouTube or TikTok star. That's kind of what I see. But what I see really doesn't matter. But I'm not mad at Bomani Jones for this take. I think this take is all right. I think this take is probably true. But again, the lawlessness part, yeah, I don't know. Um, Tyreek Hill. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Tyreek Hill likes him big, baby. And I'm not talking about the women that he has the sex with and the women that he's got, like, I don't know how many kids with. No, 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 no. He wants to throw hands with the big. And Sophie Hall is a plus-size model. She's an influencer. 
with more than 2 million followers on InstaFace. She claims she was invited to take part in an offensive line blocking drill after watching Hill train in his backyard January 28, 2023. This is a lawsuit. And the Daily Mail's got it. Now, hey, big girl, it's a bad move to do this next paragraph. On her first defensive line rep, Hall alleges she managed to push Hill backward, drawing laughter from a group of witnesses, including Hill's trainer, mother, and sister. Oh, no. Oh, no. What are we going to do? Hall then claims that Hill became embarrassed. He became angry. And that they insisted they do the drill in opposite positions. The second rep was interrupted by a puppy. Third rep saw Hall hold her own. But on the fourth rep, Hill allegedly charged into her violently and with great force, leaving her in excruciating pain. All right. Well, Hill, a National Football League superstar, perennial All-Pro, first-team All-Pro, and world-class athlete, nicknamed a cheetah for his incredible combination of speed and strength, made his living humiliating and outperforming his competition on the football field. Unfortunately, after getting humiliated in front of friends and family where he was knocked backwards during a friendly football lesson by his friend Sophie Hill, Hill became enraged and forcefully and personally shoved Miss Hall, severely fracturing her leg. Yeah, I'm, I'm siding with Hill on this one. I'm sorry, I'm siding with Hill. I mean, a biggin gets in the ring, and a biggin wants to throw hands with an NFL player who's notably crazy. I mean, all you got to do is listen to Tyreek Hill for one, ten, five minutes, and you know the dude's nuts. So the dude is nuts. You think you're a badass. You shoved him down. I'm sure there's taunting. And then you get mad because Hill came back at you. I've never been for hitting women, ever. I've been very vocal about it. And my thing is always like, what do you do after? And I would equate it to this for Hill. Now, Hill's a dumbass. We all know this. But Hill knocks this girl down the big end. Then what do you do? I'm sure she's screaming. I mean, fracturing a leg, it, it hurts. I'm sure she's in pain. Now, what does this idiot Hill do? <clears throat> That's what I've always said about hitting a woman. Like, what's your next move? Now, what are you doing? Sorry? Take it back. Get in your car. Leave. Go downstairs. Fall asleep. Hit the bottle. Hit the drop. What do you do? I've always said this. I've never understood it. I will never understand it. And I don't understand this from both sides. Like, hey, lady, what are you doing? Now, all of a sudden, at the end of this lawsuit, or at the end of what I read, oh, now it's a friendly match. Oh, so it starts out with Hill getting apparently knocked backwards. Everyone's taunting him. Then it happens again and again. And now, later, because the young lady got hurt, it was supposed to be a friendly thing. Yeah, I'm calling bullshit on the whole thing. Yeah, I got to tell you what I'm doing. All right, uh, Hill, you're a known idiot. If I'm the judge, Danny D, court is adjourned, or court is in session. Uh, Hill, I've made my ruling. You're an idiot. Why don't you stay away from women? Why don't you give that penis a break? Just take a few months, you know, get your hand going, some lotion, and, and take your time with that. You, you're an idiot. But you, lady, what are you doing? Like, why are you lining up against an NFL player going hard enough to knock him backwards, and then you're going to come to me, bitch, whine, and moan that he knocked you backwards after you testified, you testified, and you testified that we were all taunting Hill? So you get in the cage with a lion, and then you get mad when the lion hurts you. I don't think I care about either of you. If I were, and I am the court of law right now, you, Hill, get the hell out of here. If I see you back, I'm going to charge you with something really stupid, put your dumb ass in jail, or maybe we'll just castrate you. And you, lady, go back to shaking your big ass, go back to taking your clothes off, putting your finger in your mouth, or putting your finger on your ass and being an influencer. But if I hear about either of you two again, in any physical contact, I'm going to throw both of your asses in jail. You're out. That's what I would do. Marquette beat the living dog. 
beat the living dog out of Providence. It ended up 91 to 69. But I got to tell you, I watched a little bit of that, Tyler Kolick and the rest, Cam Jones. Holy cow. I mean, they were up as much, I think, as 28. The score, even though it's 91 to 69, wasn't even that close. No, I'm not kidding you. I don't, it wasn't that close from jump. Marquette moved into my top five because Marquette, after a loss, has started doing that to people. Their defense is imp- – what did Mike Tyson say? My defense is impenetrable. My heart is exempt. You know, that's what Marquette's doing. Creighton, Creighton got their offense back. Seton Hall didn't look so good, but I'll tell you this much. I watched a little bit of Creighton too. Creighton got their offense back, but I'll tell you why they did it. Because, well, Seton Hall had to help too much. You can't help on Creighton. You got to be able to guard your own. That's what St. John's did. When next time you watch Crate, watch how many threes they get from putting the defense in a scramble situation. Creighton's not the quickest team, but somehow, some way, teams overhelp. Seton Hall was overhelping. The ball was whipping. 85 points later, Seton Hall got the hell beat out of them. It was kind of fascinating. I was wondering how Creighton was going to jump back. They moved to 21 wins. They won by 21. 21 seemed to be the number last night. But you know what? Man, oh, man. Creighton gets its offense going. The NCAA tournament is all about making shots. But I'm telling you, St. John's was able to take their man, guard their man, not overhelp, not get into scramble, and Creighton couldn't score. Creighton could score last night. Uh, let's just let's just call this what it is. Let's just say what it is, ladies and gentlemen. You know what I'm saying? Here's the deal. Uh, I hate to say it. I'm not sure this is true. I don't know what is true. But I got to tell you, this Kinnett kid for Tennessee might be the player of the year in the country not named Zach Eady. No, I'm not going to lie to you. He is so good, he is such a great transfer, Dalton Kinnett is, that you sit there and you go, wait a second now, hold the phone. You know what, Rick Barnes and my man Dylan, toes might be tapping, I think it's Glendale, for the Final Four. That's how good this kid is. This kid last night, I could not stop watching. The other games I was flipping. He goes for 39 last night against, against, Bruce Pearl's Auburn team, and they needed every one. Look, I thought that Tennessee was was whooping ass. It felt like Tennessee was whooping ass. It only ended up an eight-point loss. But this kid is sensational. I think I saw where maybe both Trey Wallace and um, uh, Clay were saying that this is the best player maybe Tennessee's ever had since, you know, Ernie and Bernie or Ellen Houston or whatever. Man, oh, man. He was literally – I'm being literal. He was literally unguardable last night. I mean, he was incredible. If you haven't seen him, you got to see him. And the word on the street, and I don't know if this is true, but the word on the street is Indiana had a chance to get this kid, but they stuck with their guy. They stuck with their guy, Xavier Johnson. Man, I don't know. And I like Zakai Ziegler. Zakai Ziegler had, what do he have? I'm looking it up here. Yeah, I thought he had 11 assists. He had nine assists. Man, oh, man. I got to tell you, this Kinnett kid, Holy hell, is he good. Uh, Auburn, high, or excuse me, Alabama last night, high scoring off uh, 103 points over our guy Chris Beard. I'm not happy about it. They've won their seven straight. They're hot as hell. They're seven straight over Ole Miss. They haven't won seven straight because Kentucky took them to the woodshed last weekend. But it's interesting. Alabama gave up like 115. Now they're giving up 88. It's got an interesting formula. I think they scored in the 90s against Kentucky. Now they're at 103. Interesting formula for success in the NCAA tournament. And ladies and gentlemen, the best player, the best freshman in the country, John, Johnny Kitzinger, he's about this tall. 2.7 seconds to go for Illinois State. Uh, underneath, out of bounds, down one against Missouri State. Johnny Kitzinger goes up from the baseline, sets a screen, receives a screen, comes over to the right baseline, catch, whap, boom. Game winner, Illinois State moves to 500. Andrew Dockich and his crew are hot. I'll be there Sunday at Valparaiso for the season finale. Illinois State was up 10 
10 with five minutes to go. And Missouri State's, who's arguably the most talented team in the Missouri Valley, said, no, no. They started locking up and scoring at the rim. And Johnny Kitzinger, Mr. Basketball out of the city, as a great state of Wisconsin, had 20, eight assists, four rebounds at five foot nine. Mm. 